Welcome to Lunchbox Sessions, bite-sized industrial training. Hello, it's Carl from lunchboxsessions.com and welcome back to part three, our final part on the pressure compensated flow control. And in parts one and two, we looked at how the overall system of this simulation functions, what the purpose of the pressure gauges are, and a few other basic system parameters. But then in part two, we spent a lot of time noticing that the resistance to flow leaving this flow control, which we could change by varying the amounts of bricks on our brake shoe brick stacker, even when that load pressure changes, we noticed that the value of the pressure just preceding the needle valve was always about 100 PSI higher than that load pressure. And we noticed that that consistent delta P, that automatic setting of 100 higher, is what gave us a very consistent flow rate through the needle valve and helped us lock in our RPMs which was our objective. And we noticed that that was done by taking the load pressure through a load sensing passage, combining it with a 100 PSI spring, adding those two values together is what accounts for the pressure value preceding the needle valve. But what we did not yet cover is how is this pressure set up exactly? Well, what we need to do now is move back to the left side of our pressure compensated flow control and notice a pressure transition here depicted from red down to orange in this zone and also noticing that there is this passage this pilot passage that wraps around to the back the left side of our compensator spool and so what we see is that any pressure acting on this surface moves the spool to the right up until now, we've been talking about what happens if we increase pressure on the right, which moves our spool to the left. But if we reduce bricks on the brick stacker, then we notice our spool moves to the right. Well, that's thanks to pressure that is acting on the left side piston face of our pressure compensator spool. Now, one would have to imagine that the pressure needs to change, increase or decrease, in this zone a little bit in order for the spool to move right or left and have that fight with the spring on the right hand side and so that accounts for why we do see a bit of variation on this pressure gauge preceding the needle valve but again it's not much pressure change and so we notice that even though bricks change on our brick stacker our rpm stay pretty closely locked in it's only a few percent of variance, which we said in part two is very good for a control device that is only made up of mechanical parts. But notice that the pressure drop across the initial control orifice here coming in to the pressure compensated flow control, you will notice that as that wraps around to the back on the left side, that that assembly looks very much like a pressure reducing valve and you would be quite correct to observe that because that is basically what is happening here at this first passage it is a pressure reducing valve that is constantly setting up a pressure just preceding the needle valve as indicated on this middle gauge that is only 100 psi higher than the load pressure and again, it's a pressure reducing valve that is constantly getting a load sense pressure here on the load sense passage, plus the 100 PSI equivalent force of the spring. So it looks a little amazing and miraculous at first, but it works just like that. What we want to look at here in this last final part is what should happen if we get fluctuations on our system pressure. Again, we said back at the beginning that this pressure coming into the flow control is as a result of pressure controls that are at our fluid source. So it's either the relief valve near the pump or perhaps it's the pressure compensator on a variable displacement pressure compensated piston pump. And what we were hoping for was very consistent inlet pressure because 
if inlet pressure fluctuates on its way into a needle valve, if all we had was a basic orifice, then once again, the flow rate through this needle valve would change, resulting in an undesirable variance, which would be shown on the tachometer. So the fact that this valve can also take care of fluctuations in inlet pressure is a second amazing feature for a good quality pressure compensated flow control. If you're watching what I'm doing, I'm causing fluctuations in our inlet pressure. Something is happening elsewhere in the hydraulic system closer to the pump, or perhaps somebody is changing a setting on a pressure control earlier in the hydraulic system. But what's interesting to note is that the pressure differential across our variable control orifice is not changing. And thus the RPMs on our hydraulic motor are staying pretty closely locked in. There's only a minor variance and we've already said that 2%, 5%, these would be very normal and excellent values across the full range of normal pressures for a flow control of this type. So the pressure compensated flow control has the addition of a compensator spool as noted by the extra straight arrowheads that you see on the ANSI symbol in the lower left and the ISO symbol beside it and that makes this type of flow control quite unique. That's all. Thanks for watching. We have hundreds of interactive resources like this live schematic so you can try out your wild ideas without blowing anything up. Get started at lunchboxsessions.com.